Welcome everybody to our webinar on Central Study of Higher Education here. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dr. Vasiliki Papadispa from Cardiff University. And Vasiliki is a reader in social sciences education at Cardiff. Her research sits within political sociology applied to international higher education and focuses on three interrelated areas, internationalization, higher education, academic mobility and migration, international research collaboration, local, global inequity and public policies, and universities and knowledge exchange with their international local communities and networks. She served on the steering group of the Global Challenges in Higher Education and Research Gear of the World Universities Network from 2018 to 2022 and led the OECD's countries review on knowledge exchange in Lithuanian universities and research institutions in 2021. She was on the research management committee of the ESRC RE Centre for Global Higher Education and directed the Centre for the Study of Higher Education 2017 to 2020 at the University of Sheffield. Uh, Vasiliki held a Marie Curie Inter-European Fellowship at the University of Oxford from 2005 to 2008 and was a co-investigator in the Economic and Social Research uh, Fund Council Research, Brexit, Migration and Higher Education. And it's really, I'm really delighted that you agreed to come and talk to us today about Brexit and the future of higher education hopes and concerns. So whenever you're ready, Vasiliki, please start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. It's, it's, I'm really delighted to be able to talk to you about um, Brexit and, and higher education, a topic I think that uh, never ages um, too much. It's always you know, uh, every every now and then we have some uh, political sort of either uh, progress or uh, going back to some uh, earlier sort of uncomfortable uh, position. So I think despite the overall fatigue with, with Brexit, there is still, I think, uh, quite a lot to explore. And um, I'm going to, to, uh, to draw on a study that we did um, uh, a couple of years ago that included uh, 12 universities across the four um, home nations in the UK. But I will also give you an update about you know, the, the initial consequences that we are observing. And of course, I'm, I'm sort of delighted to, to talk to, to colleagues who uh, I'm sure will have a keen interest in, in what is going to, you know, what, what happens with, uh, with Brexit on the ground and how, you know, higher education is, is, um, is affected or the degrees of resilience that it can, um, can um, express. So um, I'll just take you back to you know, this wonderful picture. And uh, here we have a quote from one of the leading um, Brexiteers, Daniel Hannan, uh, just a few days before the referendum in June 21, 2006 sort of wrote about what Britain um, looks like after Brexit. Um, so uh, Brexit is green. So he says it's uh, 24th June 2025. Britain is marking its annual Independence Day celebration. As the fireworks stream through the summer sky is still not quite dark, we we'll wonder why it took us so long to leave. The years that followed the 2016 referendum didn't just reinvigorate our economy, our democracy, and our liberty. Uh, they improved our relations with our neighbors. Uh, the United Kingdom is now the region's foremost knowledge-based economy. We lead the world in biotech law, education, et cetera, et cetera, new industries, and even a wonderful prediction, older industries to have revived as energy prices have fallen back to global levels. And um, uh, steel, cement, pepper, plastic, uh, ceramics producers have become competitive again. Um, and um, another friend of his, so um, 
also predicted that hard Brexit would boost the UK by 135 billion over five years. So we're just, I think, two years away from um, when all that um, sort of the dream will materialize in 2025. It's only 2023. So two years to sort of catch up quite, uh, quite significantly. Um, but so uh, my focus will be more on um, the university sector, on different uh, UK universities. And I think it is, uh, it's not a controversial statement to say that the EU membership for UK universities uh, was beneficial. Uh, univers British universities had opportunities for research and teaching collaboration. Uh, they were able to develop uh, research leadership, uh, they benefited from funding, and they have also benefited from the mobility of students and staff. So um, I think we can, yes, we can, we can say that their relations with uh, their counterparts in Europe were positive uh, and productive. So what um, so, you know, the slogan, take back control, uh, what did that mean for the university sector? Well, I think it actually meant unwelcome national limits to what the universities could do. It also meant risk uh, to universities' international reputation and strong global brand uh, if the sector was to, to be perceived uh, to become more insular and inward looking. It also created a dissonance with um, university self-perception as international. And it, of course, meant restrictions on access to EU-wide resources, capabilities and talents, and actually access uh, for to, to those EU-wide resources, capabilities and talent meant signified empowerment and agency for UK universities. That's the reason why in 2015, uh, the Universities UK, uh, so the sector's uh, membership body, took a remain stance and said EU membership plays an important role in the global success of our UK universities and in the contribution they make to the economy and society. So not everyone was happy with, uh, uh, with uh, the membership organization uh, taking that sort of what was seen as an explicit remain stance and, and getting involved in, in a political debate. Um, but it was also surprising that, um, you, yeah, that universities, research, higher education um, became an issue, a policy issue. Um, it was the Leave campaign that, that saw research and higher education as, as policy issues. So the Remain campaign hasn't included uh, research and, and higher education, and it's quite sort of surprising um, uh, the, the absence of, uh, of higher education as a policy issue from uh, the Remain campaign is, I think it's, it's really surprising. But the Leave campaign argued that EU collaborations were hindering the UK. And um, so it was kind of very parochial, very narrowly focused and Brexit would provide more international opportunities. So um, you, uh, uh, British universities could really reach, you know, their true, true uh, global uh, potential. Okay. Um, but what happened? I mean, in the last, in the last, um, the last two decades, I would say, since early two thousand. Uh, and especially from 2010 onwards, we have um, observed an extensive and intensive internationalization in staffing, students, 
research, international co-publications, strategic projects, and uh, UK higher education institutions are uh, undoubtedly one of the most global UK institutions. So, um, of course, that's uh, we could we could go on and talk about research and teaching excellence, but we all know. I mean, in our we all study higher education, so we know how all, all these um, uh, sort of all this discourse about excellence can also be fabricated. So certainly, th th there has been a concerted sort of branding effort, uh, branding initiatives to boost the international reputation of of um, UK universities since Blair years. Um, but they, they were also there are also perceptions of Britain as a tolerant sort of open society um, that can function as a key magnet for international students and also academics within an increasingly competitive higher education landscape. So I think when uh, Brexit happened, um, and as someone who had studied international um, Europeanization, I would say more the sort of the European dimension of internationalization uh, for a number of, of years, I, I was surprised to, to see how much um, you know, the UK higher education sector had uh, sort of uh, gone through that phase of Europeanization. And although there was, I think we, we could get all these proud um, internationalist statements, I think that that Europeanization was kept much more quiet. But the facts are here. Um, so we have we had, um, for example, seventeen percent of all academics um, were from the have been from the EU. The numbers remain largely stable what was more surprising was that trend that we we saw in the last decade just before the referendum that 40 percent of all new posts uh, academic posts were filled by non-uk eu nationals um and so and also eu academics were much more likely to be submitted to the research that the the the, the uh, research uh, assessments that we have every every five years. Um, so important numbers also important numbers of uh, EU students, and especially a kind of uh, quite in 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 uh, an important section of the EU doctoral student body um, were EU students. So again, here, what happened, uh, we also had, for example, um, a, a significant successes, I would say. We had uh, all the, more than half of the EU nationals, uh, no, sorry, EU nationals born more than half of the European Research Council uh, grants. Uh, awards, research, research funding. There, there were research papers that were co-authored, and we also had, for example, if we look at the share of um, national versus uh, international funding, we had about twenty percent of UK's research and development funding was from abroad. And if we compare that, you know, four point three percent in Germany or three point eight. You can see here, either you can consider that as, as a success in, in, uh, in attracting that, uh, that European funding, or you can see it as, as a reliance or dependence. Um, so, well, post-Brexit uh, and uh, has, has um, witnessed a sharp uh, drop uh, in EU student involvement, um, enrollments, and I think, of course, we have seen about fifty percent of, of of a decrease uh, in in new students 
uh, enrolling uh, various programs in higher education. And I think that's, okay, how can we think about that? Of course, we can think in terms of revenue. Uh, we can think in terms of what does that mean for individual study programs, uh, certain, certain uh, subject areas or certain uh, we're attracting significant numbers of FEU students, but we can also, I think we also need to consider the various ramifications. Uh, it's not only, um, you know, students as numbers, EU students as numbers decreasing, it's all that ones that filters through the, the, the institution and then the sector, what that, what that means, really. Um, so uh, a bit of um, now uh, what has happened since, because when, when, we, uh, when concerns were raised um, initially, uh, it was all discounted as project fear. You know, we were just um, very pessimistic. We could only see the negatives and one had to remain positive and, and uh, uh, but the facts now are here. So uh, six, seven years later, we 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 have seen uh, that, uh, for example, if we take the EU Horizon funding, has been a significant decrease uh, in a decrease in UK participation and coordination. Uh, for example, in Horizon 2020, the UK was the second largest recipient. However, now uh, I think it's, 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 it's um, seventh, just behind uh, Germany, France. We, I even have more updated days than um, data than that. So now it's behind Germany, France, Spain, Italy, uh, and also the Netherlands and Belgium. So every time we get an update, um, it's kind of the UK is going farther down the, the hierarchy of, of success. Uh, it has also been calculated that have the UK kept pace with Germany, so assuming would continue to apply the same way, um, they would have participated in, you know, 2,742 uh, more projects, so 30% so more than it actually did. We have a drop of uh, UK grant income by 38%, and uh, the currently Horizon Euro participation has fallen by half, and um, so something that made the, the headlines uh, in The Guardian three, three four weeks ago, uh, it was about, um, you know, Oxford um, having received uh, a significant amount during Horizon 2020, but only 2 million in Horizon Europe, Cambridge hadn't received any Horizon funding by 31st of January 2023, which was kind of shocking news. Uh, uh, the UK uh, audience. So, but here we can see the UK participation in framework programs from the beginning 20, uh, 2003 up to 2022. And you can see a sort of a steady, the, the rise and fall. Um, um so yes from 2000 from the beginning it sort of increases we have those years with with the drops uh, this is normal because these are the years when the new framework program starts so it's normal to see that that drop but then it's the the the, the trend is clear from 2008 to 2000 and uh, what is 13 it continued uh, so it was a rise and then it is just uh, it has just been dropping since. Um, uh, yes, and that's what are the, the numbers that I gave you earlier. So, um, so the UK, uh, the known association currently, the UK is not associated to Horizon um, Europe. Um, so. Uh, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol um, is was given as a reason um, for 
for the for the ratification um sort of for the delay in that in that in the ratification of the association the association has been uh, approved in principle um so hopefully after yesterday's um, agreement uh, I think now there is a kind of renewed optimism that that will pave the way uh, for uh, the UK Association to Horizon Europe. But currently, so we see that um, the final the final data give the UK third. Um, so we can see the effects of Brexit uh, in Horizon 2020, but we can see them, we can see the kind of remarkable decline in its ranking in Horizon Europe. So, of course, uh, what, uh, what I have here is, is the tip of the iceberg. So we, we know... Um, I mean, there is revenue uh, that is involved, and this funding is is very important for um, the UK research base. But I think something that is less well known is the the importance of um, the network, and that's what lies underneath. You know, that's uh, what is immersed in in the water. Uh, so everyone counts the money, and uh, and I understand that um, you know it's 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 important, it's tangible, it's the visible signs of success. But what is uh, I think even more important is that uh, network dynamic, that uh, association uh, to different EU framework programs had enabled. Here we have, um, you can see the cutoff date is, is a diagram uh, that is uh, produced by the European Commission. And so we have the cutoff date of 2017. So it's pretty reflective, you know, uh, of the, what was happening just before Brexit. So you can see that the UK is the biggest node. And what is also less well known, uh, because um, here from, from the UK, uh, EU collaboration might be seen as sort of uh, regional, uh, rather sort of restrictive. Uh, I think it's important to see all the countries that are associated with Brazil, Australia, Canada, US, China, South Africa, Russian, um, uh, Ukraine, uh, and, and so on, Israel, and so on and so forth. So it's not, it, it is uh, incentivized through EU funding, but it is not restricted to EU participants. So these networks, enable these not only EU collaboration, but sort of broader international collaboration. And uh, it's clearly what, uh, what uh, has happened is that the UK has lost its network centrality. And um, network centrality is a key position because kind of can help improve knowledge uh, capabilities. It can help organizations improve their structures and strategies. Uh, you can capitalize on resources and knowledge. You, you, you act as the magnet and therefore you know, it's much easier to, to sort of attract the, 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 the people and uh, what they bring with them. Um, and so I think uh, what happened is that uh, the UK has lost this uh, uh, this network uh, central positioning that it had. And it's not only about, you know, well, why that matters? Uh, why is it important to be one of these sort of key members within a network? Or what, what happens? is because the network does create what I have called here these virtuous circles. So it's um, we know that um, a, a key factor, for example, in a country's success in EU research funding is its ability to attract researchers and prevent brain drain. So um, 
there has been research showing that, the, that Switzerland and the UK were the most attractive countries uh, with in, in uh, sort of within the EU um, horizon framework, and Israel and the UK have the highest stickiness. So, so the UK here is actually one of the two most attractive countries. So it can attract. Uh, people, but also people do not leave. So, um, and uh, it attracted EU doctoral uh, students and researchers. Uh, it attracted uh, other uh, collaborations. Um, we know, for example, uh, that the UK was still performing in, um, in uh, ERC grants, in Marie Curie grants, which actually is not just the money, is the people who, who, who are uh, earning, uh, who have uh, been awarded those, those grants. And so we know since the beginning, uh, the UK has, has did retain the position of a leading recipient of ERC, ERC grants. Also European funding supported fields such as archeology, span classics and computing. Which, for which there isn't enough uh, national funding. Um, what we know about the EU academics, um, well, there hasn't been an exodus, so EU citizens haven't left massively, uh, but we now see for the first time uh, that there is, uh, there are fewer young people coming in. So uh, there is 1% from 17%, we're now at 16%. And what we can see is that uh, the cohort, those who are still here remain because uh, the kind of age. So we can see the cohorts of EU nationals are becoming, are moving towards sort of the, the older uh, age brackets. And we have fewer uh, younger acad academics and researchers who are joining. Uh, so what I would like to sort of to just a uh, brief summary up to now is that we have these changes in student numbers, uh, approximately half uh, that the new enrollments have dropped by half. Uh, we have um, uh, a, a notable sort of loss of of uh, EU funding, uh, UK being less attractive to uh, Marie Curie um, researchers. Um, and um, also we have fewer younger researchers even without the Marie Curie granting who, who, who are joining. But so all these trends are sort of changes are sort of significant in themselves. But I think what we have also to sort of uh, unpack uh, these intersections and the interdependent interdependencies. So, what are the effects on research culture uh, performance? It's not just about uh, quantitative changes. Uh, and to give you a, a bit of an insight into those aspects, I'll go back to uh, a large scale qualitative study that we did, just uh, uh, it was uh, focusing on, on Brexit and its effects on, on universities. And that was a research council, uh, ELC European, no, it's a economic and social research council uh, funded study. So, what what we we try to um, sort of assess the the effects the perceived effects of Brexit on higher education, just after the the vote, uh, we uh, proceeded with um, case university uh, with case studies of twelve universities in the four nations, and we had uh, ethics approval for naming the universities. Uh, so in England, we had UCL, Manchester, Durham, Sheffield, Hallam, Coventry, Exeter, Kiel, and so on. So it's a, it's a kind of a mix of um, traditionally sort of research-oriented universities and other universities that are more regional. 
Um, we so in Scotland we had St Andrews and Aberdeen. In Wales we had South Wales. In Northern Ireland we had Alstead University. So we we did uh, 127 um, interviews with um, mainly institutional leaders, senior university executives, um, administrators, and academics with uh, with leadership responsibilities. But we also included uh, some student and governing council representatives. So what were the prominent topics of, of discussion? Well, here it's a kind of cloud that shows its students and research. Um, not very surprising. We can also see European, we can see funds, we can see collaborations. Um, internationals and so that gives you a bit the flavor of the two uh, most interesting uh, topics uh it was a difficult just going back it was a difficult a difficult uh period i think for uk universities uh there was um, a lot of anxiety uh, a clear sense of loss um and uh, there were also people tried also to appear sort of um, reasonable. Uh, some people tried to say, "Well, it's a time; it's time to be to, to sort of try and catch the last train." So there were people also showed opportunism, um, but give you a bit of of a, of a flavor. Uh, so some opportunism here. People want to catch the the last wagon before it all disappears. Um, others say, well, what can we do? This is what politics is. The world is going to be what the world is. It's not within our control. So we kind of universities just receive. We are all, all to take us. Um, so a bit of panic. We're going to suddenly have to make decisions about the year students, the year postgraduates, people on different types of contracts, research grants, reapplying. It's going to be a testing environment. Um, we we did try to ask if they had the strategy. So uh, the response was, well, we're all finding uh, too hard to think of a strategy last, you know. I think you have to recognize that not all is in your control, et cetera. Um, uh, so as we start drifting towards the exit days, it's going to be to become more difficult, a dif different set of rules. Uh, and there was also concern of how people are going to carry on with uh, business as usual, uh, with all the risks of reputational sort of disadvantage. Um, so these were sort of some, some of the statements that give you a flavor of how people approached it. Let me see how much time I have. So um, when, when there was um, a significant sort of concern about um, fewer uh, EU students coming to the UK, and uh, we, uh, we analyzed how, you know, what sort of representations um, were formed around those students. And I have categorized them into three categories. People spoke about EU students as a resource, as a diversity issue, and as an issue for competition. So let me see if I have, oh yeah, I'll go back here. So as a resource, it was a primary concern raised by institutional leaders. Uh, all 127 participants refer to EU student numbers. Um, so they, they, but first of all, it was what will happen. Uh, will will universities, uh, to to what extent universities will suffer as a result? Is uh, we know that numbers will reduce. Uh, but is that a threat to, 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 to the university? Can we go under? So there was that, that concern around, you know, every time you have a threat, there is an assessment. Could we see um, universities closing as a result? Um, well, the response was that 
No, um, there will be shifts uh, within sort of the different subject areas. There are some departments that are particularly vulnerable, but the different, you know, the, the institutional leadership took the overall view that despite, you know, there will be changes internally, but on the whole, um, we, we're not particularly uh, vulnerable. So the, diver the second big concern was diversity, and uh, people spoke about the potential loss of EU students. They said this uh, undesirable, uh, regardless of income concerns, and that's because it's going to decrease the sector's diversity. And then um, the, the third thing was around competition. Uh, 72 participants discussed competition, and they said, well, competition is it's going to competition is going to increase further because there will be um, there will be a shift in student preferences of where they're going to go and study, and we're going to have more internal competition, uh, but we're also going to be in competition with the EU, um, other countries, Ireland, and so on and so forth. So let me sort of move um maybe i have I have another five minutes um so yes as i said i'll try to give you a bit of flavor for each of the um, of the themes uh well they were mainly they predicted that um, the student numbers are, are going to drop and that was a combined effect of the disincentive of bureaucratic processes that they will need a new visa, uh, but it was also, of course, the fees and not having access to uh, the student loans. But people also feared that Brexit was sending an un unwelcoming message. And there was this notion of, you know, the UK becoming a hostile environment to, to foreigners. Um, you know, the if the fee structure is such that it becomes prohibitively expensive, uh, we already have high fees in this country. If you look at our fees compared to our European colleagues, generally they don't have any. So, you know, why would you go to the UK? You can go elsewhere and you don't come out with an amount of debt. Um, so, yes, a hostile environment. Um, I'll, I'll have to move a little bit faster. So again, uh, in terms of, of um, the research themes that appeared in relation to, to EU research, it was attracting talent. There was a concern around UK's capacity to act, you know, as a magnet for academic talent. It was collaboration. Uh, collaboration will, will, will shrink. Uh, there will be fewer opportunities, uh, fewer capabilities for collaboration, and also EU research was sort of benefiting local communities and regions, and that is going to disappear. But there was also there was also concern about the UK losing its leadership, research leader, leadership position, and and sort of being aware that you have to be in the game to win it and also once you play you know the reach becomes richer so there is those there those cumulative and interaction effects uh that lead to either an increasing capacity or a slowing or diminished research capacity and standing so attracting talent for example i can give you I thought this code, uh, quote is quite nice. Uh, the UK is becoming a less attractive destination. And we already know that the life of an academic is a very uncertain life in many ways because of the uncertainty of funding. Uh, even as it currently stands, it's very competitive, a very competitive environment. And this is an extra twist of the screw in some ways, or perhaps an extra two nails in the coffin. And again, not wanting to come across as entirely bleak, you know, I'm not entirely sure what the alternatives are, other than it's becoming increasingly less attractive. 
um, hear about the collaboration uh, universities and people also spoke it's it, it is about getting more funding getting the right people to do more research but there was a lot of concern also especially in the medical field about uh, the UK being one of the sites where new um, trials are, are implemented and the local populations do benefits from benefit from those trials and you have you have the pharmaceutical companies. So there was quite a lot of concern. We, we had three fields, medical um, sciences, we had uh, law, and we also included uh, engineering. So I think uh, it was the medical uh, scientists who were mostly uh, concerned. And that's about, yes, giving up uh, EU research leadership. So here is just a photograph of one, depart one department of the Oxford University. And you have five uh, European Research Council holders just sitting, uh, you know, uh, one next to the other in, in, in one department. So, um, yeah, they, they, they're really very keen on e ERC funding. So, um, a few uh, final couple of final slides. So there was quite a lot of when we did uh, this analysis of sentiment. You know, we found there was quite a lot of worry, fear, uh, but also people trying to turn fear into hope. Um, so the what was the worry and the fear was that uh, you know the UK will become somewhere. Anyone would love to go, great pass, but you're not likely to find anything really happening. So it was kind of a diminished UK. Um, that, that, that has been the fear and the worry. Um, there was, okay, I, I showed you the analysis of the, the vocabularies there, the students and research appeared you know the topics that people um spoke about mostly uh but there was a sense that research was the chief concern and um, what happened was i think participants identified potential risks evaluated the scale and sometimes they kind of dismissed them as uh it would be hopeful of the future uh from a place of real or imagined security uh, and it was surprising that after a very bleak analysis most people said um, you know I'm an optimist and therefore I believe so we had a surprising number of people who depend on their own personal credo or motto uh, when thinking about the future so so well, hope is probably our last reason because it's, hope is the only reasonable alternative. Um, they, they hope that all parties would pursue the best possible outcome. And it was also a tool to resist the immediate insti instinct of hopelessness. Um, and it was also an instrumental necessity, you must hope, because that's the path to success. And actually, they did demonstrate a, a, a huge amount of resilience because the number of going and continuing to apply for funding, despite all the uncertainty up to now, is something that is, you know, I think quite remarkable. Why did they want? So why they 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 had this uh, hope and uh, because they they had faith in the university in science and the rational nature of, of humans. So these are the three sort of foundations for their hopes. Um, universities espousing excellence and quality, British education as a global brand, universities having survived uh, centuries of history, the good of science will triumph over evil politics, uh, researchers will continue to collaborate, but was also human nature, common sense, rational decisions, bringing about mutually beneficial collaboration. So, um, just let me check because I think we, my last um, 
two slides. Uh, we know that these accounts, we ask them about the institutional strategy. And when you ask about the institutional strategy, you are going to have well told positive accounts because no one wants to be seen in a kind of bad light. And they wouldn't expose, of course, uh, sort of sensitive institutional data. Uh, and we, we have started an analysis of the sort of figurative language that the that, uh, participants used. And I think what is remarkable is that um, there were a lot of metaphors of physical movement, the word access was used, and, and access is a metaphor, and as is networks and insula, is, they have become part of our everyday vocabulary, but it, it, all these words show sort of uh, metaphors for physical movement, and they can we use those metaphors of, of movement um, in order to kind of point to areas of progress and goal orientation, but we also use them when we have concerns about being stuck, facing obstacles, having to retreat. Um, and so the pro-Brexit discourse said Brexit would enable a shift towards a sovereign UK, engaging confidently in a wider, more global networks. But I think those metaphors have also, we can also question what, what images of Brexit Britain, a global Britain, uh, they convey. Um, so I think in those metaphors of movement, they were mostly negative associations. So um, less access, uh, shrinking pool. Uh, so it's kind of, we, we will continue to analysis with that, but I think uh, they do question all these representations of global Britain as sort of more open um, and uh, made us wonder whether, you know, global Britain could be a lesser Britain uh, on this occasion, especially uh, as far as UK higher education is concerned. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Basilica. That was a very uh, interesting um, way that you kind of wove in the whole uh, Brexit impact in terms of the students, the, the research and positionality of uh, higher education. Uh, can I open it to the floor? Anybody have a question for Basilica that would like to ask? Sheena, yes. Thank you. Um, that was very interesting. Um, and I just have a couple of questions. Um, I just on the point you made about um, the language kind of moving into the space of metaphor um, and so on in terms of the future. Um, is there anything concrete in terms of where this new kind of research funding may come from? Or is there any talk about how that's going to look in practice? Yes. Um, so I think there was... Um... There, there was um, there were, there have been plans for a plan B, as they call it, that would be a national uh, a national funding for international research. But actually, I think we're going to have progress now, and I think association is kind of much more certain after uh, yesterday's um, uh, agreement. Um, so I think that will pave the way for um, UK's association to Horizon Europe. But there, there was um, what, what happened, there was a national guarantee. So people were told continue to apply, continue to apply. And those who received funding, they had that funding was underwritten by uh, the UK government. So uh, we know, for example, that a ERC um, uh, awards. Um, the ERC did not release the money because, of course, they couldn't sign the contracts. So uh, I think one in eight of uh, European Research Council um, uh, grantees moved, left the UK in order to take up their grant. So they went to another university. One in eight is quite, you know, quite a, a big number. Uh, but there has been since 2016, 17, there has been, the government has been underwriting all successful projects in order to sort of uh, minimize disruption. I think that was a good measure. Uh, however, what 
government cannot control is uh, all the you know the disruption in the partnerships because we know that UK applicants were asked to not to lead any any uh, big big project because that was seen as a risk to the whole consortium and the funding. So they kind of they had to um, to give up uh, research leadership. Uh, and take kind of the smaller, smaller place that could be sort of a role that could be negotiated. Um, so yeah, so uh, uh, the funds were uh, underwritten by the UK government. There was talk about um, uh, um, a plan B, but I think in all fairness, um, the government did say that uh association to horizon europe is their preferred option but with some threats and so on posturing and you know all, all that okay thank you very much Ina. anyone else have a question mike do you have a question or i do actually um thank you very much for this talk is very is very interesting i actually have two questions first is just um a curiosity about whether or not this hope and optimism has persisted. If they are still that hope, um, I, I would I would guess not. And the, and the fact that Horizon Europe was used as a, as a negotiation point um, for yesterday's agreement uh, would be my evidence for that. But I'm I'm curious if if there's still that sentiment. And then the second question is: What's is there a connection between, or to what extent is there a connection between the talent attraction? and the centrality in networks. Obviously, grants, uh, research collaborations are a big part of that network. But it, it seems that bringing in staff internationally, they also have a tendency to bring with them networks. Yeah. And so that might have a compounding effect on the, the decline in, in networks, especially if you're talking about international networks. And of course, so much of those are based on personal relationships uh, of individual academics. So those are my questions. Thank you. Yes, yes, I uh, completely agree. So I'll start with the second one. So when uh, there was um, a study, they tried to sort of um, weigh the different factors that could play uh, in the in in um, uh, EU research funding success, and they found okay, well, what can it be? So the most important factor is sort of being able to attract those researchers. And of course, those researchers come with their own networks, with their collaborations. Uh, they come, uh, they know doctoral students. So they do come with those, you, you've got all these um, sort of, um, how would they call organic, organic networks. So that's, that's a factor. And I think once you have achieved that sort of network centrality, then the, in itself, that becomes a, 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 an, an attractor, you know. So once you have, you, you are seen as the place to go for, for research, you have, for example, we know that um, British universities were seeing us, uh, the, the, the knowledge broker, you know, the most efficient knowledge broker for companies, for the private sector uh, within Europe. We have, you know, they, they did analyze all this data and it just shows that once you acquire that, you know, an important position in the network, and then that opens, opens doors further. So in itself, it becomes, so it's a cumulative effect. You don't become, you know, a key member of a network just immediately but throughout the years the UK rose to that position of being a, a key or the key member and once you have you have acquired that positionality then it becomes you know it's a kind of something that fits in you you get all these uh, um, sort of effects uh, is the, the 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 richer becomes richer, like you're the most visible, and so that, this is how how it works, I think. So that was the second question. Would you mind reminding me the first one? I, I was just curious if if that optimism uh, has persisted. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. 
So it is it's really um, so uh, remarkable resilience. I haven't spoken to, to anyone since yesterday, but from what I have seen through Twitter, I think it's going to be hugely welcome news. And I simply couldn't, you know, understand how people knowing all these uncertainties were, were able to put months and months and years of work in something that couldn't come, you know, to fruition, not because your project hasn't been selected, but because simply there are bureaucratic um, sort of um, because of, of all the political um, problem and, and uh, the associated bureaucracy. So I think there was that message that went through um, different universities, keep applying in order to show your enthusiasm and your commitment, because if you want the government to consider association to Horizon, you know, they got rid of Erasmus on the basis of, oh, well, it, it, it doesn't, we can only fund our own students who don't need to have reciprocity. It costs us a bit of money. Uh, but they said, you've got to keep applying because that's the best message to send to uh, European colleagues and also to government. Government could say, you know, uh, I'm going to keep the money. Why would I commit for seven years? I can only commit year by year, which is the kind of national way of funding. Whereas the EU framework program, you do have, you know, a long period of time to plan. And so I think it was quite a conscious effort to sort of make the case that we do remain commitment, committed and we want this collaboration. So I think um, it's a kind of, it's going, it's going to be a, a renewed hope um, that uh, I think what follows yesterday events is, is a renewed hope, I would say. Okay, thank you very much for listening, Vasiliki. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk and uh, raising so many interesting perspectives in relation to Brexit and higher education and done in such detail as well. And I'd really like to thank you. So thank you very much indeed. Thank okay. you. Thank you for attending the webinar. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. A pleasure. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.